Welcome to the Healthy Gut Podcast with Rebecca Coombs, the place where you can learn how to achieve a happy, healthy gut. Here's what's coming up on today's show. Welcome to episode 69 of the Healthy Gut Podcast. Apologies for the little break in between episodes. I've been on vacation. I've been in Vanuatu and I'm bringing you uh, a podcast all around how to travel with SIBO. But first, we're joined by the lovely Kayla Sandberg Lewis. And today, we're talking all about traumatic brain injuries and SIBO and gut health. Before hearing Kayla speak at a conference, I had never considered the impact any brain injuries I've sustained over my 40 years of life could have had on my gut. And it was a complete aha moment when I saw her speak. She talked about the impact of how our brain and our nervous system is so central to our digestive health. And that's when I was like, oh my gosh, I have had so many brain injuries. And I talk about what they are in today's episode. So I'm sure you will get a lot out of it like I have as well, because it was absolutely fascinating listening to Kayla and then having the great pleasure of sitting down with her when I was in Portland, Oregon recently. Kayla Sandberg-Lewis holds a master's degree in behavioral medicine and has a private practice specializing in acquired brain injuries, anxiety and stress-related disorders. In recent years, she has been exploring the link between brain injuries and gastrointestinal disorders. Board certified by the Biofeedback Certification International Alliance as a neurofeedback practitioner, she is also trained in peripheral biofeedback. Kayla has several tools at her disposal to help the disordered brain calm itself and function more optimally, thereby leading to improved vagal tone. Kayla serves as adjunct faculty at National University of Natural Medicine, where she created the Applied Psychophysiology Tract in the Master of Science in Integrative Mental Health. I'm sure you're going to get a lot out of today's uh, podcast interview with Dr. Kayla Sandberg-Lewis. If you do, I'd love to hear about it. What's your aha moment? So head to the show notes page, thehealthygut.com forward slash T-B-I. That stands for Traumatic Brain Injury. And tell me, what have you learnt from today's episode? Have there been incidences in your life without realising acquired a traumatic brain injury, just like I did, and you can now start to see how that might be a missing piece in your SIBO puzzle. I'd love to hear from you. If you would like to get the full transcription from today's show, which is super handy, particularly for those days when the brain fog is bad. We all know what that's like, don't we? Then you can do so by becoming a member of the Healthy Gut Podcast. It's absolutely free to join, and it means that you get the transcription from every episode. So head to today's show notes page, thehealthygut.com forward slash TBI. That stands for Traumatic Brain Injuries. And all you need to do is sign up. Just pop your name and email address down and you'll become a member of the Healthy Gut Podcast. Not only will you get the full transcription from every episode, you'll also get special members only offers and promotions and you'll be the first to know when a podcast airs. So without further ado, here is Kayla Sandberg-Lewis talking all about traumatic brain injuries. Welcome to the Healthy Gut Podcast, Kayla Sandberg-Lewis. It's wonderful to have you on the show today. Well, thank you. I appreciate you asking me. I saw you speak at the uh, Integrative SIBO Conference in New Orleans uh, in 2018, and your presentation was so powerful personally for me because you talked about traumatic brain injuries and the connection that they have with the gut. And I realised as I sat there listening to you that I have had many, sadly, traumatic brain injuries and I could see the correlation between my 
my gut and my brain. So I, uh, I'm i so thrilled to have you on the show today so that we can share your uh, amazing knowledge with the listeners of the podcast because if I had that, oh my gosh, that is me moment, there will be many others who are listening to the show. So what I'd like to start off with is just talking a little bit about why we should be thinking about our brains when it comes to our gut health, because this is a SIBO and gut health podcast, not a brain podcast. Yes. Well, the brain is in charge of everything. It's the sentinel in the body. It knows what's going on everywhere in the body. And when the brain, especially the brain stem, where the autonomic nervous system resides, uh, when that is disrupted, then everything in the body is disrupted, and it can stop our digestion. It can alter our peristalsis, the MMC. Everything can either be altered or stopped by an injury to the brain. Let's talk about the um, nervous system. My listeners will have heard of the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. Um, why should we be thinking about these two systems uh, and our, our gut and our brain? Well, the autonomic nervous system is made up of the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. The parasympathetic, we know the sympathetic is fight, flight, freeze. Parasympathetic is rest and digest. We hardly ever use that nickname for it, but... When it's in dominance and ascendant, when it's working right, then our digestion works right. So when the brain, when the autonomic nervous system is disrupted, our digestion is disrupted. So anytime we go into sympathetic dominance, it's harder to digest, even without a brain injury. How can we know if we are in our parasympathetic or sympathetic nervous system? Well, it's usually a gut feeling. <laughs> you know, you usually feel at peace. You feel a able to take on the world. You have more peripheral vision. You have more saliva. You have a slower, easier breath pattern. So there are just many ways that you can inculcate parasympathetic dominance, too. You can yodel. You can sing in a group or sing alone. You can practice diaphragmatic breathing if your diaphragm is in the right place. Sometimes we have to address that. Um, you can meditate, although with brain injuries, meditation can be very difficult. So it's, there are many ways, though, to inspire slower, easier, you know. One thing is to prepare your food uh, rather than drive up to the takeout window because the smell of sm food is actually going to be uh, uh, evocative for the digestive system and you'll notice that you have more saliva in your mouth. So, well, that's suggesting that you're going into parasympathetic dominance. Mm, that's really interesting. And that piece about having more saliva in your mouth, that's so interesting. I never knew that. Oh, yeah. It's the first stage of digestion and one of the first things that stops. So when you're scared, you can't whistle because you don't have enough saliva. So um, the digestive system, and I think I mentioned in, <clears throat> excuse me, I mentioned in um, New Orleans, the book by Robert Sapolsky called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. Fascinating book, and it'll explain everything much more in detail and vividly than I can possibly describe it. But saliva is the first line of digestion. And so when we go into sympathetic dominance, it's almost as if our body is saying, uh, maybe you shouldn't be trying to eat. Maybe you shouldn't be doing that right now. So we're going to cut off the saliva. We're going to alter peristalsis. We're going to make things more difficult to digest your food. So mm. fascinating um, line of, of defense to try to, to give us more energy for that fighting or fleeing. And yet for so many people, we are very rarely in that parasympathetic nervous state and we are stuck 
uh, in that fight or flight zone and often without even realising it. I was in that zone for the majority of my life pre-SIBO diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And I had to really work at calming down, particularly around mealtimes, because I would eat my meals on the go. I never sat down for a meal except for dinner. Dinner was my uh, was generally the meal I would more often than not sit down. Um, I would prepare and I'd sit down for. But breakfast and lunch and my snacks would be eaten running, walking. I would be working on the computer, having meetings, doing mm-hmm. everything but focusing on digestion. Mm-hmm. How do we get around this? What 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 are some simple tips that you've got on how we can start to change that? Well, one is very boring, and that is to chew your food until it is absolutely liquid. And that will... One of the things that is very important for me to explain to my clients is the importance of the brain stem. The brain stem is the part of the brain housing the autonomic nervous system, and it has no language skills. It's the oldest part of the brain. And it's really good at reading cues. It can tell what's going on around you. If you suddenly hold your breath, it knows there's something bad happening. And it's going to send a cascade of of, um, changes through your body so that you can be ready for whatever that bad thing is. Unfortunately, we, like you say, we live there all the time. And so it's the cause of all these stress-related disorders that we're trying to combat. So by fooling your brainstem into believing the world is a safe place, you can induce parasympathetic dominance. So that is breathing so slowly the brainstem goes, oh, Rebecca can't be in trouble. She's breathing so smoothly. That's very good. We can back off. Um, Chewing your food until it's liquid. Rebecca must be safe or she wouldn't be able to do this. So that's the brainstem is very tuned into our physical cues and very unable. You can't take it to therapy. You can't talk to it. It has no language skills. All you can do is demonstrate. So, you know, when they say it's, don't listen to what I say, watch what I do. And that's exactly how the brain stem functions. Wow, that's really interesting. And it makes me realize that I have been um, doing some activities without even realizing how I was impacting my brain stem. And when I first uh, commenced the journey of SIBO three and a half years ago now, I uh, recognized that my speed eating and my lack of focus around food was hindering my recovery and it was really hurting my digestion. And so the two things that I implemented that I can now see that were really powerful, no wonder I was seeing such positive uh, results, was breathing. So before I even sat down to eat, I would start doing some deep breathing exercises. So breathing in and then breathing out for longer than I inhaled. And I would do that until I felt a sense of calm uh, come over me. Now I'm And for me, it was just, am I feeling calmer than I was before? I didn't need to necessarily be in a complete zen-like state, but I needed to feel less anxious or less wound up. And I was preparing every meal because I was on a SIBO diet, so that helped. Uh, And then to really force myself to eat slower, I would put my knife and fork down between every mouthful and chew And I would visualize my food going in because I was really uh, hell-bent at that time on recovering as quickly as humanly possible. I didn't realize at that time how chronic uh, and recurrent SIBO can be and what it would be for me. But once I trained myself into that process, that's now how I eat. And if I ever have to eat in a hurry, let's say I've gone out and we're going to the movies and we've gone to grab a bite to eat beforehand – then if I have to quickly finish my food, it makes me feel quite sick and I really don't enjoy doing it and I avoid it as, at all costs. That's great. That's, you, you covered one of my next steps. You know, as besides chewing the food until it's liquid, yes, to take each bite very consciously and, you know, and, and a state of reverence when, and gratitude when you're eating 
it goes a long ways for uh, invoking that. It's a, it's hard to be fearful and grateful at the same time. So you're, you're, um, I, I use the analogy of a cat door. Your autonomic nervous system is kind of like a cat door. It can only open one way or the other. And, um, and that way, you, you know, you're either sympathetically leading or parasympathetically leading. So the gratitude, the chewing slowly, the taking the time. I ask people to turn off the TV, turn off the computer, put their phone in the kitchen and eat in the dining room if it's possible. Um, well, it's always possible to get rid of the phone wherever you're eating. But uh, try to avoid the distractions. I always uh, suggest if you can't afford f fresh flowers, at least a picture of flowers. Candlelight is lovely. Something that really, even if you're eating alone, make it a sacred time. You're feeding the temple. It's the, you know, they always talk about the body is the temple of the soul and, and um, you're feeding the temple. You are. I've had many people say to me, oh, I, I live on my own, own. There's no point to make an effort with my food. And I always counter that with, well, I was single for such a long time before I met my partner and I ate on my own for many, many, many years. And I made my uh, particularly dinner a really sacred time. I looked forward to coming home to prepare a delicious meal for myself. And, um, and I think that we can still enjoy this moment in the day, even if we are sitting there on our own. And, uh, uh, you know... I, I think it's important. And so it's interesting to hear you talking about just the power that actually has on the nervous system as well. Oh, absolutely. You mentioned something about um, people who have had a traumatic brain injury finding meditation difficult. Yes. And that's had a little ding, ding, ding in my, <laughs> now I know, traumatically injured brain. <laughs> um because I find meditation difficult. It's something that I've often thought, gosh, why can't I be better at this? It's really challenging for mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. What is it about having a brain injury that makes meditation challenging? Meditation is always challenging, uh, no matter how healthy the brain is. But it is, again, getting back to that brain stem. There's less wiggle room. There's less area for quiet. Uh, quiet can be dangerous. So there, there's an interpretation of quiet. It's hard with an injured brain to focus on the breathing. It's, very, it's hard to, with an injured brain to maintain a thought pattern <laughs> for an extended period of time. To hold, especially if there's not something holding you in that channel, you know, that's channeling your thoughts. So uh, I, I assume these are some of the reasons. I am more theoretical in this than factual as far as just observations over time. And the more people I work with, I work often with brain-injured people, not always, but um, many of my clients have a lot of anxiety, depression, and no history of brain injury. So, but the brain injured people in particular have a very difficult time with uh, the meditation, the peacefulness. Let's talk about brain injuries. Yes. Traumatic brain injuries versus non-traumatic brain injuries. What are they? Well, a traumatic brain injury occurs through an event. Um, non-traumatic, that can be... A birth defect. It can be. Um, I, f I find all of them traumatic myself. I mean, they're all damaging to the brain and, and certainly causing difficulty in the future. But gosh, there's so many ways to hurt a brain. Uh, you don't have to hit anything to have a traumatic brain injury. Uh, people believe that they have to have lost consciousness. That is not the case. Um, they don't even have to be disoriented after a brain injury. So um, the, the brain is not snug within the skull. There's a lot of space in there, especially if a person's dehydrated. There's going to be more space in there. So with something like whiplash or flexion extension, where the head moves forward and then snaps back, it may never touch the dashboard or the back of the seat, but the brain is banging against the inside of the skull which isn't even smooth. It's like a cheese grater in the front. So it's a, it's a pretty solid mass 
and this um, gelatinous thing that the brain is made of, it's kind of like a soft boiled egg, a little like pudding. It's not a particularly um, firm s uh, substance. It's, it's uh, more gelatinous. So it smushes against, like a water balloon would flatten without bursting. You know, if you push a water balloon against an uh, immovable object, it squishes out. Well, that's kind of what the brain does. And unfortunately, the way the brain is structured within itself, it's um, pretty intricate. And all the nerves are designed to not touch. They have to have the little synapses between the axons and the dendrites. With a brain injury, you can have those synapses go away. And so nerves are rubbing up against each other, and it's pretty similar to having a short in a, in a wire, wiring system. So, Let's talk about the types of things people might do to, to cause one of these traumatic brain injuries. I mean, I think we can all think of, okay, well, if you fell and hit your head um, or you had a huge laceration on your head or, or you were knocked out, we, can, we, we understand them to mm -hmm. be traumatic brain injuries. But what are some other ways that we might injure our brains without us even thinking about it? Heading the ball in soccer, uh, getting tackled really hard in, so in uh, football, um, little fender benders. Uh, there's documentation that uh, a fender bender as low as mileage as three miles per hour can cause brain injuries. So little tiny bonk to the back of the fender can cause a brain injury. Um, falling out of trees, the um, wrong end of the baseball bat. I mean, that's happened with a lot of people saying, oh, gosh, sixth grade, I was playing softball, and, and I got too close to the batter I was uh, catching. So that, that happens uh, quite a bit, flying off the bicycle, roller skating, ice, walk, trying to walk on ice. Um, just met a woman the other day whose legs fell out from under her and she landed on the back of her head. Um, rolling off the, the uh, changing table as a baby. Of course, babies' heads are the biggest part of their bodies, so they land first. Um, falling out of the bunk bed. Uh, near drowning. Domestic violence is a huge source of brain injuries. Um, lack of oxygen of, and due to anything is a brain injury. So there are a lot of ways we can do it. And most people come in saying, well, I never hit my head. And um, I've been collecting <laughs> things people have said, like, I fell out of a second story window, but I never hit my head. And what I have to point out to people is that your central nervous system is not just your brain, it's also your spinal cord. And so if you land on your butt really hard, that's going to reverberate through the spinal cord right up to the head, and you will probably um, cause a brain injury that way. The, um, the spinal cord uh, is encased in the spinal column, which is, I tell people, think of it as an articulated broomstick, and then the skull is more like a bowling ball sitting on top of this articulated broomstick. And really, if you think about it that way, it's amazing we don't have more head injuries, more brain injuries. I really like that explanation of it. It really, you go, oh, yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah, you land on your butt, you're getting a brain injury. I mean, depending on how hard you land. But. Yeah, and you've also, um, one of the things you uh, have in a handout is broken noses or bar brawls or blackouts, those oh, types of things. Oh, yes. And yeah. something that's really, uh, unfortunately, a common occurrence, it seems, outside of nightclubs in Australia, and I don't know if it's the case here, um, it's called king hits so where someone knocks someone out with one hit often um you know a headbutt or something like that and it's it young people are dying quite commonly because they're having these extremely traumatic brain injuries oh. these one hit wonders um and those types of things can also be part of a traumatic brain injury sure picture. if you survive it yeah um yeah, the, uh, there's a thing here where the kids hang upside down and chug from a keg. And, and uh, I met a young man who landed on his head from doing that. Well, I'm sure that the beer didn't help, but, you know, there was a combination of factors. I have um, worked with a young person who told me that 
every time he he drank, he blacked out. And um, I said, well, so when was the last time that happened? Thinking this is something he would have avoided. <laughs> he said, oh, last weekend. And he, all his friends black out, all of them. So it's it's a social pattern, and and um, it's a little hard to break a habit when it's everybody you know and everybody you socialize with. So that can be a hard sell to, to get people to stop that. And you've also got surgeries requiring general anesthesia. General anesthesia can be very hard on the brain, especially the aging brain. And there was a study that was done in 2014, or published in 2014, I believe, that um, tracked elder brains after um, general anesthesia. And the anesthesiologists have kind of a, a mythology about how they can tell how deep a person is. And in this study, they did an electroencephalogram on the patients and could tell how deeply their brains were slowing down. And the anesthesiologist, there was a huge disconnect between what they believed to be true and what the EEG was showing. So it's my understanding that there will be more, uh, as, as this ex- the understanding of this expands, there will be more use of the electroencephalogram in surgical units. I don't know that it's, um, you know, it's four years down the pike. It takes a long time for these things to incorporate into practice. So I'm hopeful because I've had many people come in in their 60s. They've had hip replacement or elbow replacement, something like that. And their cognitive decline was just remarkable after the surgery. So we work really hard on brain health and trying to get them back on track. Mm. So there's a, a, a long or large list of things that you can do that uh, can cause a traumatic brain injury and I feel like I tick nearly all of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I look back at my childhood, I clearly remember flying over my handlebars on my bike and winding myself badly. I um, had my head pushed into a concrete pillar and a window at, at my school, which were both times required stitches to my head. I've had my nose broken. I don't think I ever fell out of trees, though, because I was always a little bit scared of, um, of heights. Uh, I had a near-death, uh, a near-drowning diving, ac- a scuba diving accident, wh- which uh, I lost consciousness, I had a lack of oxygen, got the bends, spent three and a half days in a hyperbaric chamber and did end up with noticeable brain damage from that, which uh, resulted in um, I had temporary loss of words and some loss of short-term memory and significant loss of balance, which took me many months to um, recover from. And uh, and then I've I've been an avid skier as well, and I have had some pretty spectacular falls, going fast down the slopes to the point where people have come over and said, "Are you okay?" And you get up and you go, "Oh, I'm fine, I'm fine." And, well, and there's you're so much embarrassment and shock and all those other things. People often deny that there's a problem. Uh, you can ask a person after a, a car accident, you know, and they're walking around with a dazed look but they'll say they're fine so it's uh it's very difficult for self-identification it is and I've also been in a car accident when I was younger and we were hit from behind and hit so hard we were propelled into the car in front so it was double whiplash uh because we got the, the the dual impact from the accident and I walked away for many years believing I was fine from that and my mum and my sister had um, quite significant um, soft tissue damage and whiplash injuries and it was only when I was starting to get older once I hit my 30s that we could see that actually my spine had um, sustained quite a lot of damage and uh, I had just somehow been able to get on with life without noticing it so you I feel like most people will have done something at least one thing it's in their life it's hard not to have <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if if you have um if for the person who's listening and, and they're thinking oh gosh I've I've done that you you shared a very interesting statistic with me around the likelihood of if you've had one traumatic brain injury the likelihood of you doing more and as we can see I've had many <laughs> well after the first you're three times more likely to have a second 
and after the second, you're eight times more likely to have a third. And after that, it just goes up exponentially. And it depends on the severity of those first three, how much more frequently. And it's because our brains lose some processing ability. And so we become more uh, able to misjudge <laughs> more likely to misjudge distance or speed and get ourselves into a fix. I had one gentleman I worked with, he, he would come in for a tune-up and he'd say, I know I need a tune-up because I'm walking into the bookshelf again. And he apparently his bookshelf was behind his desk next to the doorway. So when he'd get up and turn around, when he was fine, he could walk through the doorway. But every time um, when his brain degraded due to whatever else he was doing. Uh, I think there was some alcohol involved in that pro pro part of the process that we finally addressed. But um, he would walk, not on alcohol, he wouldn't necessarily be affected by it, but he would walk into the bookshelf. And that was his sign that he needed to come back for more neurofeedback. So... That's interesting. And I go through phases where I drop things. I pick things up and particularly in the morning, first thing in the morning when I'm trying to put makeup on and it will always almost be my mascara and eyeliner or eyeshadow. And I literally pick them up and bang. They're, on, they're dropping on the bathroom counter or in the sink or on the floor. I've smashed so many cases of eyeshadows over the years because I've gone oh what's going on with my hands and it also makes me think of a time that I gave myself a traumatic brain injury quite a significant one through missing something and that was playing in an above ground swimming pool in Australia uh, as they're quite common and someone threw a ball for me and I missed it and I and I was too close to the edge of the pool and I somehow flipped out of the pool and landed on my head on the bricks below and concussed myself had a enormous egg on my head was off school for I think about a week with major concussion and that was from simply missing <laughs> which I now can see that it was probably due to all the prior traumatic brain injuries I'd given myself. I, I used to joke I not realizing I was brain injured myself but I used to say I can make anything into a contact sport you know jacks I could I could hit myself in the face when I'm playing jacks so that's um, very common that we become less able to judge distance, let judge velocity, speed, all those things are, are kind of mysterious to some of us with head injuries. So. Let's talk about the connection between our injured brains and our gut, um, particularly those of us with SIBO. What's happening when we are injuring our brain? What knock-on effect is that having with our gut? That's a good question, hey? I've got loads more just like this coming up after this break. We'll be back in a moment. Let's talk about the connection between our injured brains and our gut, um, particularly those of us with SIBO. What's happening when we are injuring our brain? What knock-on effect is that having with our gut? There was a fascinating study done with mice. And um, with these mice, th these researchers have an incredible capacity to work things down to a level of impact that um, they can measure pounds per square inch by dropping a little uh, weight and, uh, and just delivering the same load every single time. So what they figured out was how much can we drop on this little mouse's head and not cause any gait problems. So think of all the times you bonked your head and you didn't shake your head afterwards or feel disoriented. So these little mice are walking away from this little bonk to their head. Three hours later, some of them are sacrificed. 
They go into the small intestine, they look at the microvilli, and they're already shedding. Then 72 hours, another third of this population is sacrificed, their villi are fusing. And by seven days, they have ulcers in the walls of their small intestine. So this is why um, it is urged now that we not think of brain injuries as events. We think of them as a disease process. They set in motion a disease process that's going to go on for a very long time. Well, if you think about the brain getting injured, the little microglia up there, the, the immune system of the brain, are sensitized. They're ready to go into a red alert for, for the brain's uh, survival. But then um, when the cytokines, the inflammatory cytokines are released from the intestinal wall because of these ulcerations that let things get right into the bloodstream, then that goes up to the brain and just inflames the microglia. So there's this loop that's going on. The brain is injured, it's going to get re-injured by this chemical process, and the gut is having a hard time then healing. So this is why we want to do a full holistic approach, not just kill the little SIBO bugs. <laughs> we want to get the whole system back online and the brain working again and, the, and heal the gut. What are the types of people that you see with uh, digestive issues uh, where they're unidentified or untreated traumatic brain injuries are actually a major contributing factor. Um, can you talk a bit about what that person looks like, what they might be experiencing? They look like everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, like, uh, for example, a young man who had gastroparesis, and um, he had been a soccer player, and he had been a real star soccer player heading the ball and he had done a lot of that and all of a sudden he couldn't play anymore and because his gut hurt so much it wasn't that he had any idea that he'd hurt his brain um, so the gastroparesis was not responding to any of our known um, supplemental approaches or anything like that so they sent him to me and we started doing the neurofeedback and um, it's a, it's a form of neurofeedback that's called perturbation model. It perturbs, it perturbs the brain by giving it information about its own uh, performance. And most forms of neurofeedback are a little more like exercise. They're more like uh, getting on a treadmill. And eventually they should help, but this perturbation model is a little easier to get things moving and get them moving quickly. We also use something that's... Um, along the lines of a pulsed electromagnetic field. And between those two things, uh, his gastroparesis uh, resolved, so that was great. Uh, we had a woman who was, um, as a child, she had her own horse, <laughs> and that horse liked to buck her. And so she had a lot of head injuries from that. She did a lot of other things. She had no, she'd never identified as a head injured person. But again, she had um, really persistent SIBO. And um, so we started doing the neurofeedback and her GI issues resolved quite a bit. Um, another woman, we figured it was the MMC um, that was not just not kicking in and she tried all sorts of things and so we started doing neurofeedback uh, with her and and the MMC seemed to turn on one of the things that's happened is I isolate her but there have been many people with that MMC problem um, they seem to be more prone not all of them but some of them have been more prone to visceral hypersensitivity so when it turns back on they don't like it it doesn't feel good. So we have to really work on what that is and embrace it and realize there's a period of adjustment to that. And they generally, if they can hang in there, it resolves. So 
Um, does that answer your question? It or? does. And I actually did a really wonderful interview with Dr. Megan Taylor around visceral hypersensitivity. So I've got the links to that episode in the show notes if you would like to go and listen to that. And yet again, I thought, oh, that is me. <laughs> <laughs> I People laugh. My mum used to call me the princess in the pea. She said, you are so sensitive. You will feel, feel the pea under 20 mattresses, Rebecca. <laughs> and my partner jokes and she calls me Miss Sensitive. <laughs> I'm just thinking of the people that, and I see this in the forums, I, I see it with the people that contact me that they say, I, you know, I, I, there's just no pro-kinetic that works. I feel like everything has just stopped. And if they're listening to this and thinking, oh, I have, yes, I um, fell when I was roller skating and I came off a horse so I flew over the handlebars and they can see, oh, I can see a bit of a, a connection here between my MMC isn't working, I've got chronic constipation or my transit time is so slow from mouth to anus that just it takes days and days and days for food to come through. What do we do next if we're starting to go, aha, this sounds like me, where do we go? <laughs> well, it so much depends on what's available in your community. Um, I recommend looking for the perturbation model. I don't know. Is it okay to mention a website? Yes, it is. Okay, oakslabs.com has providers all over the world. That's O-C-H-S, labs, L-A-B-S, dot com. And you check the providers. Um I know there's some in Australia. Uh, <laughs> Guess what I'm doing. <laughs> so that's the website. perturbation model of, of neurofeedback is, is what they have. And um, those, the one thing you might find with the, the practitioners is they may not be geared towards GI problems and they may not be geared for TBI problems, but they, it doesn't really matter if you talk to them about what the issues are. You can have them call me <laughs> if they want to talk about it. But it's um, it's one of those uh, first steps that I would greatly, highly recommend. Of course, I also recommend acupuncture. Don't do it on the same day that you do neurofeedback. You want to give your body time to process information. Uh, so I suggest you separate it by a day. But there are some forms of acupuncture that are particularly good for head injuries and gut problems. Um, are you able to name what those forms are? No, I wish I could. Um, I don't. I don't know. But I, I know practitioners here in Portland who are particularly gifted in working with uh, both GI and, and brain injuries. So um, I, I just know that it works. I know that it's, it can work. Uh, when people tell me that acupuncture doesn't work, First of all, it has over 4,000, 6,000 years of history, so I don't think it would probably survive. You just probably didn't find the right practitioner for you, and there are so many different ways to do it. So uh, keep trying. Uh, with the, uh, what I call, I'm not the only one who calls it this, cultivated low arousal is learning how to invoke parasympathetic dominance. It's going to be your best friend when it comes to helping with um, motility. Uh, when you mentioned the constipation, it reminded me of a person with the inverse problem. I had a, a client who was um, needing to uh, commute, a two-hour commute, but she would have to stop eight times along the way to void. And um, so we, again, and that was based in a brain injury, and we did the neurofeedback, and that all resolved. She went on a trip to Germany and had a great time. So um, it, it doesn't have to be constipation. It can also be uh, diarrhea. Mm, so Yeah, definitely. What about vagus nerve exercises? Well, there's the yodeling, <laughs> the singing, the uh, yawning, um, and the acupuncture is great at stimulating vagus nerve. There's so many different ways to... There, there are some websites devoted just to vagus nerve stimulation. So, yeah, that's great. And it's, that is the component of the um, parasympathetic nervous system that you're in, invoking or 
or uh, trying to stimulate. And, and the way that it's all connected is that the enteric nervous system is embedded in the parasympathetic nervous system. So that's how the gut nervous system, which can function on its own, uh, is so tightly tied to the brainstem. With somebody like myself who's now recognized I've done multiple <laughs> injuries to my poor little brain, do you see um, quicker resolution? Like, can you expect to see full resolution with somebody that might have had one injury over a period of time with treatment versus someone like myself that's probably done about 20 different injuries? Like, how does how does it work with treatment and what you can expect? It's... It's more age dependent than anything else, as far as I can tell. So the younger the brain, the more plastic it is, the more it responds. But that doesn't mean that older people won't heal. Uh, I've worked with people in their 80s and 90s who have had great response. So it depends on A, the individual, B, the extent of the um, injuries, and then C, the... um, the plasticity of that particular brain, so the age, unfortunately. But um, And if you have a f- familial link, like everybody in your family has the same set of problems, it's going to take a little longer. It's more of a miasm. It's more of a, a genetic component. It's going to take longer than if it's caused by one or more injuries. So if, you're, if your system came into this world uh, free of those um, predilections, then, <laughs> then you're going to have a better time, um, or more, an easier time overcoming it with the neurofeedback. Mm, wonderful. Well, that's good. That's good uh, to hear that there can be uh, light at the end of the brain tunnel. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, there, there have been some really remarkable turnarounds for people. Yeah. Not always. Nothing works for everyone, and I can't ever guarantee, but um, it's really, it's pretty impressive. But I have my favorite story that has nothing to do with brain injuries was um, when I first started out, before I even did neurofeedback, I was just doing stress management, and peripheral biofeedback, which is hand warming, heart rate variability, that sort of thing. And this lovely young woman in her late 70s came in, very sweet. She was um, married to a minister, and she had been having gut problems since the time she was 16. And I um, did my intake with her, And then I suggested, and she'd had multiple surgeries, she'd had all sorts, nobody could ever figure out the problem. So before we got started with any of the feedback, at the end of our session, I said, well, I'm just going to suggest that you chew your food very, very slowly. And then I'll see you next Monday, and we'll get started. And I got a phone call, voicemail, and it sounded like she was pretty angry. And she was canceling her appointment. And I was like, oh, boy, I wonder what I did. What did I say wrong? So I called her up, and she said, nobody ever told me to chew my food before. It solved everything. Wow. And she was so mad. <laughs> and I was so apologetic. I'm sorry I didn't meet you sooner. But, yeah, so over 60 years of misery, and she could have just chewed her food yeah jeez oh it's it's uh, sometimes you just need that one little tip to to make a significant change right yeah and I think listening to to you today um and given the number of brain injuries I've given myself over the years, I can see that this is really a piece in my puzzle, uh, particularly given I have recurrent SIBO uh, and I've had long, long-term digestive issues, uh, which I can now see would have su- do have such a strong correlation to 
my poor little brain. Um, so I'll report back when I uh, oh, when great. I do some treatment in Australia and uh, see who I find out there. If you're listening and you know anybody in Australia that uh, you've had success with neurofeedback, do let me know because I'd love to love to hear. Um, now, if anybody would like to connect with you, you're based in Portland, Oregon in the United States. Uh, how can people get in touch with you? Well, they can email me, uh, K, the letter K, sandberg.lewis at gmail.com. Um, they can call the clinic, which is Eight Hearts Health and Wellness, uh, 503-894-9118. And I do 15-minute uh, consults for free uh, on the phone if people want to run by their thoughts and I, I try to save people money so they don't you know come in for an appointment if they if it's not indicated I think that's wonderful so if anyone is uh, thinking oh, it might be me I think that's a good place to start um, uh, so thank you uh, for so much for coming on to the Healthy Gut podcast today. I know I have learned a lot, as I always do when I have my wonderful guests on the show, and I know my listeners will have learned so much about such an important topic that I am sure is uh, relevant to so many of us. So thanks for joining me today. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed today's episode as much as I did. Wasn't it fascinating? Kayla Sandberg-Lewis is just such a wealth of knowledge when it comes to traumatic brain injuries. Now, you can head to the show notes page at thehealthygut.com forward slash TBI to uh, learn how you can connect with Kayla. And you can also sign up as a member of the Healthy Gut podcast. It's absolutely free and you can get a full transcription of today's episode, which is super handy, particularly for those days when you've got brain fog. I know what that's like. Now, make sure you leave a rating and review for the Healthy Gut Podcast in Apple Podcasts or the app you use to listen to this. It really helps me to know what you think of the show, and it also helps others know that this is the right show for them when they have SIBO or GI issues. And come say hi on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, YouTube, Twitter, and Google+. We're everywhere. I love hearing from you. I love getting your messages, so make sure you come and say hi hi to us. You've been listening to the Healthy Gut Podcast with your host, Rebecca Coombs. To learn more about the Healthy Gut or our podcast, head to thehealthygut.co forward slash podcast. We would like to thank Red Lemon Productions for the production and original music score of this podcast. To find out more about their services, head to redlemonproductions.com. The Healthy Gut Podcast is a production of The Healthy Gut. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.